that uh, started from the background, from the history of the um, Canadian Conference of, uh, inter uh, of uh, Nonlinear Solid Mechanics. We had four of them through the years in Canada. And uh, after that, with uh, Francesco, we decided to start this uh, series of international conferences that uh, um, began in uh, 2019 in Rome. And after that, a lot of people approached us and they said, oh, we would like to visit more, see more of Italy than just uh, Rome or Florence or Venice that, you know, all foreigners know. So uh, we decided to come to Sardinia, which is a, a, such a beautiful place, but not many foreigners have been here before. So this time is Sardinia, and uh, probably in two years from now, we will be able to show you another place in Italy. So we'd be happy if you will decide to come again in two years from now. Now, um, Francesco will say a few words about MEMOX, which is the organization that supports the conference organization. Yes. Again, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I will only uh, exploit your time a few seconds for telling that uh, in the University of L'Aquila, we invented an international research center for mathematics and mechanics of complex systems. We did it 15 years before the Nobel Prize was given to complex, complexity. And you know, it was a Nobel Prize for an Italian, Giorgio Parisi. Uh, this center has many activities. Uh, we uh, mainly support young Italians, even if uh, one half of them then got a position abroad, but this is our job. <coughs> the, the center is organizing conferences, short meetings. Uh, it is self-financed. Uh, the, the ministry is not uh, supporting us. We are doing some activity for uh, companies which supports the activity of the memo. We publish a journal, which is owned by the Università di Laguna. So we are not in the hands of a publisher. We don't need to make happy them commercially. And uh, at the beginning, we paid everything for the publishing. Now we are trying to have a small subscription. It is only 200 euros per year in order to increase the number of published uh, papers. And in 10 years, this journal became a Q1 journal in Scopus. So I, I hope that many among you will uh, be willing to submit papers in, in that journal. Uh, finally, uh, we established uh, many, uh, we, we organized many smaller meetings uh, in uh, Alghero already one time, in the city of Arpino, the city where uh, Cicero was born. Uh, a very nice Greek city inside the Athenaeus city. Uh, we organized uh, other conferences in other parts of Italy, but now our engagement is in this even some series, and I think we will keep uh, doing this uh, many times. If God wants, if COVID has shown us that uh, our decisions are not always successful. Uh, finally, I want to tell that because of COVID, we could not give uh, the prices, the same, the prices which MEMOX is uh, attributing uh, every year. So this time we will have three medals given for past years. So in the social media... Uh, the lecture for 50 minutes. So in case I have to check... So 50. I, I want to do, uh, yes. We'll, we'll, if I, when I show this, it's five, five minutes. minutes. Okay. 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 From the time I start. I think that now it is better if we give the scene to our first speaker, famous, and he proves that you can be, you can be very active even when your age is not so young. Okay. Thank. You. 
Um, with great pleasure, I want to introduce to you Professor uh, uh, Bazan. Professor Bazan is uh, from Northwestern. Uh, academies, just to name a few, the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Sciences of the United States, is foreign member of the Royal Society of London, very prestigious, and also of the Italian Lincei Academy. Uh, Professor Bazant received uh, many awards, really all the most important awards, and I will name a few. Is, uh, uh, he received the ASME Medal and uh, the Timoshenko Medal from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. He received the, the Von Karman Medal from the American Society of Civil Engineers. And he has given plenary lectures around the world and is continuing to do so. So thank you very much for being here. Now it's your time. Thank you very much, Marco, for this generous, I would say over generous, introduction. It is my great pleasure and privilege to give a lecture plenary as a consul. And I wish to thank Professor Frank, Francesco de Lizola and uh, Professor Amabili for the honor of this invitation. It is a particular pleasure to speak in this ancient city with this place of ancient engineering, the catapults, the bastions of Columbus, all that, which I feel somewhat conducive to serious thinking, which what we have to do now. I would like to speak on a subject which was somewhat neglected in engineering in general, and especially uh, in installing mechanics uh, also, namely, we always face the problem of extrapolation. And it is especially true of civil engineering because this is the only field of engineering we have to design large structures and we cannot build a full test, full size prototype to be tested to failure. That's only in civil engineering. Therefore, civil engineering is, needs codes, cannot get by, get by without them. And we need to extrapolate from small tests. I would like to address three problems of extrapolation in the light of symptotic matching, namely that of size. Uh, we have in concrete, for example, lots of data, thousands, for cross sections less than half a meter. We need to design beams up to 15 meters. That's enormous extrapolation. In time, Everybody says we need to build bridges and so forth for 150 years or 200. 95% of the data are for six years. And there is nothing beyond 30 years, only a few scattered data. The most difficult is risk. We are supposed to design structures for probability one in a million, 10 power minus six. But what exists now is like stochastic fireman methods in computational mechanics, they think they solve the problem. But these methods give probability at best 1%, probably something like 3%. So it's a long way down to 10 power minus 6. And the only way to do that is to use asymptotic matching. Some people might think use machine learning. Machine learning will improve prediction here, but there's no way to extrapolate without theory. The same thing in time. So uh, if we use machine learning, it's fine, but the theory and physics would, is essential to get anything useful. So first size. Uh, this is an example of a famous structure of the record bridge which failed. A side effect was part of the problem. Now, scaling, we should realize the problem of self, uh, starts with the problem of self-similarity. Self-similarity is a basic concept. It is the case where uh, where the response uh, can be t uh, does not depend on the reference taken. So if uh, any, any, any size can be taken as a reference, response must be similar, 
And that's this, uh, that leads to this functional equation. F is an unknown function of size d, and some characteristic size d0, and other characteristic d1. If these two are arbitrary, one can easily show that the only solution is the power law. So power law means self-similarity, and that's why it's uh, 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 endemic in uh, all problems in energy of physics uh, uh, and, and engineering. Now, using uh, simply uh, uh, simple arguments, including, for example, dimensionless analysis, you quickly include the power law for strength theory must for, have for strength exponent zero. Horizontal line, if you plot logarithm of nominal strengths versus logarithm of the size. On the other hand, for, large, for linear elastic fracture mechanics, because of dimension of fracture energy, uh, energy per surface area matters, not per unit volume, you conclude the other asymptote must be one half. So that's uh, uh, obtained immediately. But the question is the transition, which actually takes in most structures about three orders of magnitude. Uh, I played with it in late 1970s, eventually uh, concluded that it must be characteristic length of the material, and made a simple analysis, which are the main ingredients. Let's say we have tension, uniform tension, we have a damage band, and energy from the damage band is proportional to the release of energy proportional to the length of the band, A. Energy released from the rest of the structure, which can be imagined like from this most unloaded area, is proportional to square. And when, the, when part of energy is proportional to size, uh, length square, part of A, you always have transition, and this transition leads to this simple formula, that's elementary derivation. However, it can be done more systematically, which came a few years later. Uh, we take linear elastic fracture mechanics and perturb it, obtaining uh, asymptotic expansion in size, uh, uh, negative exponents, this is the expansion for size infinity, and this expansion, if you take two terms, has this green curve. We can also do asymptotic expansion for small size. So this is deviation from strength theory, or from elasticity, in the simplest case. And by perturbation method, you obtain, again, expansion, two terms. They lead to a sequence of elasticity problem, which have unique solution. You get another expansion. And this is the dashed brown curve. Now, asymptotic matching means to find a curve, smooth curve, which has two asymptotic properties here, two there. This formula actually matches these two, these two asymptotic properties. So this is, of course, a fundamental way to do that. And there are also other ways to uh, obtain this. Now, the advantage of this formula, called side effect law, uh, is that it can be related to the asymptotic expansion at large size, where G is energy release function, dimensionless, uh, oh, and this is his derivative, as the length of the notch at failure, or length of the crack at failure. This is size D, this material characteristic length, elastic modulus, and fracture energy. Now, this formula, luckily, can be converted easily to linear regression, where Y is uh, inverse of strength, square, X is simply D, that gives a linear line, and the linear regression is, of course, the easiest case for statistics, which gives all the statistical information. From that, you can get fracture energy and also width of the fracture process zone, which is, in fact, the easiest way to obtain, obtain these parameters. Now, this formula has been first developed for concrete, but then it turned out that it works for all quasi materials, which is uh, coarse grain ceramics, uh, uh, fiber composites, uh, all kinds of rocks, uh, many materials, and uh, there are many diagrams like this. This is only a fraction of what we have. Perhaps the most interesting is the test we did, Dempsey and I, uh, 500 miles of north of Canada mainland on the Arctic Ocean, where we fractured specimens up to 80 by 80 meters. This is the opposite side, this is one side of the specimen, square like this, expanded on the notch by flat jack, and it agreed with the linear fracture mechanics for sizes, uh, 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 sizes bigger than this 80 meters, actually, 
linear refraction mechanism, sea ice in horizontal fracture is reached at the measure about 30 meters. In other, other problems, of course, we deal with micrometers, so it's an enormous range of scales. Now, two years ago, we had a lucky idea at Northwestern, which shed a new light on the problem and explained some observations, namely the gap test. Uh, we take a standard three-point band specimen with a notch, and we install the supports with a gap. And initially, we load it in unixial compression, putting plastic pads here. Plastic pads, which eventually go, this is PVC, go to horizontal line. For some materials, other we use copper. And when these gaps close, there's bending moment. You do K1. The load is rising, a side effect method will give you fracture energy. You have to test the different sizes. So we did lots of these tests, and the result was interesting. For example, for concrete, uh, if we plot fracture energy normalized, so it starts with one. That's fracture energy. This is uh, strength, uh, st uh, nominal, uh, it's uh, stress, crack parallel stress, parallel to the crack in compression and goes from zero, the basic case, up to one. This is compression failure. We get this diagram. Uh, this is, these are nine tests. Uh, so this is uh, a very, very, uh, very consistent result. And this is our model, we scrape a model M7, which does not work too well here, but he is perfect here. It's sort of okay. But please, linear elastic fracture mechanics, Cohesive crack model, XFEM, all these line crack models give nothing, no effect. This is a major effect, and it is significantly path dependent, uh, so it cannot be reduced to like a parameter change of GF, it must be solved incrementally. The same test is shown here, with a picture of the test. When we tested, there was interesting also aluminum, we are still doing that, and you see side effect is aluminum too. That was not studied before, and already at 40% crack parallel stress, you increase the fraction energy two and a half times. It's a major effect. Uh, uh, my former uh, postdoc, Professor Salviato, now in Seattle, working with Boeing, tests uh, cross ply fiber composites, and here at 40% of the compressive strength, you reduced the fraction energy almost to one half. These are major effects. These are some pictures from these experiments, which are still going on and actually in several places. This phenomenon, crack parallel stress, is ubiquitous. Almost all practical problems have significant crack parallel stress. I will not go through all this. This is listed in a paper published uh, several weeks ago, but uh, shear fail of reinforced concrete beams. Uh, uh, pressurized fuselage, casing of solid fuel rocket, and so forth. There are almost always present cases with zero stress parallel to the crack. Uh, rare, although all the existing fracture specimens that we have have a zero, essentially zero crack parallel stress. So that was, this has been actually misleading information. Now, I would like to mention aluminum. This is still uh, a, prob a problem we work on. And uh, in aluminum, this uh, analysis of energy must be generalized because in addition to fracture energy, you dissipate energy by the uh, yielding zone. Uh, the fracture process zone is uh, in aluminum about five micrometers wide. The yielding zone is about five or 10, 10 millimeters with a ratio of 1,000 to one. And both have significant amount of dissipation. So, for example, when the yielding zone is moves forward, it is a trail of unloaded uh, energy that must be included in the energy balance. That's proportional to length of the crack. So that's uh, one, one aspect. On the, on the other hand, uh, uh, this uh, uh, energy, uh, of course, which is conveyed through the yielding zone, if there's no unloading, that, as we know from J integral, that does not dissipate any energy, so that's if dissipated is a, is a tail. And that leads to certain formulas which give the results. Uh, now, this analysis now gives a more complete picture. I showed basic picture, 
horizontal asymptotes to asymptotes of size one half. Now, because of large scale yielding in a small structure, you have intermediate asymptotes, which actually spans three orders of magnitude. Intermediate asymptote is a concept invented by uh, Grisha Barenblatt uh, uh, recently. And so we have three transitions. One transition scaling from uh, small size to large scale leading and to small scale leading. And here you have linear fracture mechanics. This is, of course, well known that in this case, you can use LEFM in the large enough structures. Uh, I know was, everything is shifted. I don't know how it happened. Uh, the picture, same picture again, but there's a formula which you don't see, but uh, that gives, uh, it's uh, actually, uh, as you can see, uh, same as the side effect formula, which I showed, same as for concrete, except the parameters uh, are defined differently. They depend on the uh, yield stress, uh, radius of the yielding zone, and uh, you can identify from side effect fraction energy, and this is transition from the first asymptote to the last one, jumping through this one, this asymptote, uh, again satisfying all the asymptotic properties, and it gives results at, uh, which are identical with J integral within, within uh, admissible error. Another set of tests, uh, this was, uh, this, uh, these are the tests of aluminum, so his logarithm of nominal strength, logarithm of the size, you see beautifully the side effect curve. In fact, aluminum has very little scatter, so it's very consistent, as you see. As you increase the crack parallel stress, this is changing, and this is combined effect of wide, wide process zone width, micrometer width, uh, a micrometer scale, and millimeter scale yielding zone, and to sort it out, you need to do further analysis, which are doing now, or further testing at, uh, at a smaller scale. If we plot this in, in this uh, regression plot, one over, uh, 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 no, if we plot, no, sorry, if we plot GF, fraction of aluminum, versus crack parallel stress, this is basic, and that's how it increases. So it's a, it's a major effect, in fact, it increases more than for concrete, that's uh, at 40% strength, more than doubled. Uh, then I came against interesting result, a reviewer told me, a picture of the test that you done in Westinghouse in 1970s, early 1970s. And at that time, they put, as you see here, scale specimens, and the only thing they look for is the size for which linear elastic fracture mechanics works. So they determined that uh, testing of linear fracture mechanics, which means measuring stiffness of the specimen as a function of crank length, gave correct results equal to J integral. Interestingly, at the time, nobody was interested in side effect, of course, so they did not publish it. They did, we don't know what other values here would have been very useful. Uh, uh, they only look at the la largest specimen, so uh, thinking changed. The most formidable problem of side effect, I think, is that of reinforced concrete beam shear failure. This is left part of a beam much larger than this, load, reaction on one side, reaction on one side, the side not shown. And out of some 800 test series worldwide, costing probably more than a billion dollars, only one was geometrically scaled, which is allows much easier interpretation, namely those by Teichmann and his, his, his student. So he tested three sizes, they are plotted in dimensionless coordinates, and what is noteworthy, that the cracks are similar, which is essential, for a validity of the side effect law. A maximum load always happens around here. Uh, crack starts propagating here, and when it reduces this length, becomes uh, geometry changes from uh, negative to positive, and there is dynamic failure. Now, the mechanism now we understand, so crack starts by tension, mode one, that can be modeled by linear fracture mechanics, or cohesive can model better, and then it propagates, and here the fracture energy is zero because another a big compression develops prior to the crack. So this is not failing due to the main crack which we see afterwards, but failure is actually due to compression strut, what they call uh, in strut and time model. And failure occurs by propagation of the band of splitting cracks, 
sideways and then expose this parameter outside. Again, note this compression struts area grows as a square of the structure size, while the length of this band propagation propagates as failure grows linearly. So again, you have part of energy is linear, part of it's quadratic, side effect is obviously automatic. Now, if we plot, for example, the principal stress vectors in compression, the tensile was negligible here, and they are all parallel to the crack. So it is not a fracture failure due to the main crack, but due to secondary crack coming here. So the, it's, it, it's interestingly, in European code, uh, this is ignored, this argument. They have failed based on strain. Uh, uh, this uh, side effect law was tested, of course, by many cases of individual tests, uh, which uh, I show here two examples. Uh, this is an example from a database of 400 tests, and these include uh, uh, specimens which have different reinforcement ratios, different spent to length ratios. So obviously there is additional scatter, but if you do uh, multivariate uh, uh, analysis, regression analysis, nonlinear, then you obtain this picture and the trend is captured. So, to summarize, the main effect is that in quasi metal materials, but also now in uh, the case of yielding uh, plastic hardening materials uh, like, like aluminum, the energy dissipated is some constant times material characteristic length size linearly. This is all constant two, another constant times square. And this is characteristic of all these problems, the general and the inevitably use that for same formula and no, no, no other formula. Now there is a different side effect uh, which occurs at when geometry is positive from the beginning which means uh, energy factor in increases with crack lengths at constant load. And then you obtain failure right away before, uh, as soon as the fracture process zone forms. If it's the zone of maximum stress is small, uh, like on, on top right, then uh, you get a deterministic side effect, which uh, ends up from a slope going to horizontal asymptote. And if you have a large zone of uniform stress, cracks can form randomly at many parallel locations. Obviously, the weakest link model goes to Warburg well statistics. So it ends up with a slope. So these are form deterministic formula. This is a formula going to uh, variable behavior. R is an empirical response. M is the viable modulus, which is infinite for, uh, for this case, no, no, no probability. And also, the distribution changes uh, from Gaussian to uh, Weibull distribution. Now, there are more complicated cases where you have some phenomenon with side effect on the subscale. For example, buckling can produce that, buckling of splitting cracks, and there's the materials. Then you can get different exponents. So, for example, uh, in borehole failure, exponent minus two fifths. That seems to agree with experiments. Kingway propagation in composites, that gives the same formula, but a constant, additional constant residual value, because the king bands eventually yield with uh, the buckling of the fibers, uh, and that size dependent is a, it's a fracture problem because they propagate. V notches, of course, different thing. Thermal fracture of floating ice. Uh, you cool the surface, bottom of the, uh, bottom of the plate, is at uh, zero degree C, and there is an uh, uh, eigenbending moment, and that leads to exponent minus three eighths. And in hierarchical fracture of composites, it has not been tested. You have a side effect in the failure of the studs, a side effect in the failure of propagating line of the studs between the plate and the beam, and that theoretically should give minus three, three quarters, but has not been verified. It uh, requires uh, big testing. Now, time, even bigger problem. Uh, in connection with that Palau Bridge, uh, in Realm Committee, we gather data on 71 bridges. And these are the deflection histories. 
This is deflection in, log, uh, in linear scale, and this is uh, time in logarithmic scale. So these histories go to up to about 30 years that are available, some are even 40. All similar behavior. Now, by inverse analysis, it was determined that creep does not end with a horizontal asymptote, that it ends with a logarithmic law, and that was adapted now in uh, Euro European code, that was adapted uh, also in ACI guidelines of uh, 209, uh, and in NRILAM. Uh, example, I showed this bridge collapsing. Previously to that, it deflected. And it was uh, in, within 18 years. This is the story. These are the deflection measured. Uh, codes existing at that time, ACI, Japanese code, European code, CEB, gave this result five times wrong. This is log scale, this is linear scale. What is interesting that also they measured pre-stress loss. They built nine sections on the bridge before collapse. They didn't know it would collapse. And uh, installed gauges on the tendon, cut it, and measured the traction. So they concluded that the pre-stress was 50%, not the 23% assumed by the code. That can be predicted if you use viscoplastic metals together with uh, uh, correct creep formula. Now, Creep is a very pro difficult problem and shrinkage because it involves diffusion, it involves chemical hydration, it involves expansion to hydration, several phenomena which are combining diffusion phenomena and activation energy control phenomena. So, for example, if we take just diffusion, shrinkage, let's say shrinkage is proportional to the loss of water. So, profiles through a wall, drying environment, this is initial 1%, uh, look like this. And you quickly uh, realize that for all, like on all, all diffusion, uh, this, the response depends on time divided by thickness square. That's characteristic of all diffusion problems, linear, non-linear. This is permeability, effective permeability. And these are the asymptotic cases on the left side, right side, which are known. This must be exponential, this must be a power law. And this formula, which is plotted here, gives uh, agreement with both asymptotes. And this is now used in B3 model in ACI to our guidelines also. Now, a complication arises with autogenous shrinkage. In old concrete, autogenous uh, cell desiccation, drop of humidity in the pores, or drop of chemical potential if you want, was only about 2%. Now, over the last 30 years, we reduced what cement sem content of concrete to less than one half. We are probably at the end of the road here. And that causes large autogenous shrinkage where sealed specimen would decrease the humidity in the pores not to 98% but to 60%. That produces enormous autogenous shrinkage, as big as drying shrinkage, and they interact with the drying from the side. And this is different from thin and large walls. So in a thin wall, uh, you have here uh, saturation by water, this is cell desiccation, uh, but cell desiccation rate depends on humidity. If the humidity goes down, it slows down. So in thin specimen, it was different than in thick walls, where uh, you preserve, uh, low, uh, uh, which pre you maintain high humidity for a longer time, and then uh, cell desiccation can proceed, and you get this kind of picture. So this has to be included in the predictions. Uh, I show you a picture from uh, the only test which are a long time, most of them are a few months, but Brooks in England tested autogenous shrinkage on uh, several different concretes. That's, that's a scatter. You see it does not end with an asymptote, which, has, which is assumed still in European code. It, assume, uh, it continues, goes on and on. It's, uh, uh, it's faster than logarithmic, actually, uh, uh, as data confirm. Another complication is uh, uh, having to do with scaling is uh, the, uh, from hydration. So hydration within a day, uh, cement grain, anhydrous, C3S, that's enveloped by continuous shell of CSH, calcium silicate hydrate. That's extremely low probability, the CSH. And 
as it grows, uh, of course, uh, uh, it slows down. But also, what happens is that adjacent grain in a cell skeleton push against each other. So as these grains grow, they expand the skeleton elastically or, or creeping, creeping way. And so uh, from this, it can be understood that hydration is always expansive. Most people don't believe this. They say hydration causes shrink. Yes, it was determined by Le Chatelier in 1880 that the uh, result of reaction of anhydrous cement and water combined is small volume, slightly, fraction of a percent than the original. Yeah, that's true, but uh, this for the mechanics is involved. This, this is a, like a crystal growth pressure. It expands inevitably in a skeleton if it's not a powder. So uh, this is a, I would say, correction of the power paradigm. If autogen shrinkage, all shrinkage autogens including caused by pore humidity decrease, whether it is due to drying or chemical sophistication, does not matter. That works on both equally. Uh, actually, this is proportional to uh, drop in chemical potential, which is the proper way to say that. And all swelling is caused by reversal of cell desiccation due to the immersion. Swelling is observed too in water immersion, and this is, this is it. Now, combining it, uh, Dermis are trying now to do by this formula. Total deformation is combined with shrinkage. This is asymptotic value due to drying. This is a, uh, autogenous shrinkage, the function of time, and asymptotic value of swelling, swelling due to expansion. Uh, it must all be expressed in terms of this dimensionless variable. You have here this, uh, uh, these uh, asymptotic conditions, which are actually eight of them. So we uh, do it by partition of unity, which is normally interpolation, but it's not interpolation here because as ST function inverse infinities. The same thing here. And that seems to be significantly better results than existing right now. So this is uh, some of the figures that uh, Dormes obtained, which are much better than European code uh, or existing American recommendations. So I will not go through these details. Now, another interesting point is the creep compliance curve. So you have power law for a long time because it's self-similar. It, that goes to a law, uh, the power law for the rate so it goes to a log law, exponent zero. And then you have, uh, is a logarithmic law. And then you have the aging effect, which needs to be explained through hydration. And this, uh, this, this is the part of, I will not go into detail, solidification theory, and also relaxation of micropristress generated in the nanostructure by mismatch of expansions. Now, the risk. And this is actually the toughest problem of all. So there's a considerable literature that we should design engineering structures so they don't add to the risk that people already face. So it is assumed that the risk from engineering structures should not be bigger than getting killed by a falling tree, getting eaten by an animal, uh, by Get, uh, being killed by lightning, this is of that order of 10 power minus 6. And should not increase that. So it's about, these are risks of about 1 in a million. Now, in failure, we have so far two models only. Weakest link model, brittle failure, that leads to viable distribution, and ductile failure, which is uh, called fiber bundle model of Daniels, and that gives to Gaussian distribution, or normal. They are not indistinguishable if you do less than about 1,000 of tests, because the histograms are always scattered. You cannot tell. You have to assume. However, if you extend it to 10 power minus 6, the plastic failure is here, and middle failure is here. There's a difference of 100%, 2 to 1. So there's a major problem. So when at computational mechanics, they use big codes to determine the coefficient variation. They say, okay, let's use normal distribution. They make possibly 100% error at 10 minus 6 in terms of RICS. That's unacceptable. 
that does not solve anything what we need. Uh, of course, it assumes that failure is a, is a positive geometry in this case. Now, uh, the type of distribution uh, for uh, middle failures can be determined, should be determined, not from uh, flaws on the mesoscale, uh, which is uh, correlated, of course, but it's uh, going from one assumption to another, but should be done more fundamentally from atom, uh, rupture of uh, interatomic bonds. This is the Kramer's rule of transition rate theory in chemical dynamics. The rate of breakage of bonds is an exponential. Uh, where this is absolute value. This is a Boltzmann constant. And now uh, you have, it involves always statistical breakage forwards, which means toward failure, backwards, away from failure. And that there are these corrections of activation energy here. Uh, and that leads, because a particular number, if you are in that field, is uh, uh, large enough that to a power law in, but exponent is two. And it can be shown, has been shown, that if you go through the scales from atomistic to eventually me mesoscale eventually and real material scale, at every trans scale transition you have some fracture process zone, which is a length on width. This way it works like a weakest link model. This way it works like a fiber bundle. They are combined. A weakest link model increases the exponent always. Uh, eventually gets to something like about uh, 20 or 30. And parallel coupling keeps the exponent, but uh, keeps the exponent, but extends the reach of the power law tail to inward. Uh, this model decreases that. So that gives a picture that the, the correct picture of uh, uh, is as follows. First of all, one must recognize that not like in concrete, you never can consider that there are infinite number of RVEs, surface volumes, in, in the structure. It's, uh, except for larger structure, is a finite number. Uh, then this means that one minus PF is John probability or minus PRVDs are failure probabilities. So John, Sar John Sarva uh, survival, the old probability of survival of all the elements in the chain uh, gives a viable distribution. If n is going to infinity, this is almost never true. n is finite, and then there are deviations. If it's finite, it goes away. So what I'm plotting here, this is a viable scale. So in viable scale, viable distribution is a straight line. Uh, it is given, given by this, this formula. Uh, it's, uh, if you put it in normal polarity paper, of course, it's a curve. It's a straight line, but for a small element, straight line up to probability 1 minus 1,000, then deviation. It increases size, goes by order of magnitude, order of magnitude up, and this point can be determined from size effect, because depending on this transition, you get different size effect curve, which can be measured, and have been measured. So that's a brief summary of a, of a long theory, but it's validated by experiments. So these are various uh, uh, ceramics uh, behaving in a quasi-metal way, porcelain, dental, uh, silicon carbide, aluminum oxide, and so forth. It fits perfectly, these histograms. And in this field, they still believe this is three-parameter viable distribution. That's not correct. It is actually effect of finite number of RVEs in their samples. It can be translated, has been, into uh, fatigue or static lifetime, both same behavior for static lifetime. Again, this is a review, so I will not go into detail, just want to point out what are the kind of implications that occur. Now, in ceramics literature and some in mechanics, people use three parameter variable distribution that also gives this straight line, a variable plot, and curvature. And they are contented with this zone, one zone, where both models coincide. But if the, uh, the three-parameter variable distribution is a non-zero threshold, variable distribution is uh, the first one has zero threshold, there are only two parameters. Now these are parameters, if you extend it, you come that uh, at the low probability range, 10 minus 6, is enormous difference. If you extend in size effect, 
you see that side effect will disappear. Now, they always argue, well, if the strength is one quarter of the, if the load, stress, is one quarter of the strength, there can never be a failure. That's not true. You can calculate the exponent is large of the order of 20 or more. You can calculate that as a load of 20% of strength, the, the, the specimen would fail in a time which is longer than the age of Earth. It is 10% longer than the age of the universe. So that's how it works. But it's get manifested different ways. And uh, look how it's manifested. So that's enormous error. So these arguments are not true. Let me jump back briefly what I already showed, this uh, 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 diagonal shear failure. So this is the mechanism, uh, zero, uh, zero, uh, comp uh, zero fraction energy because of crack power compression. These bands, bands of spreading of failure linearly expel this. Uh, that can be analyzed, this was this formula, of course, uh, to be extended to the calculation of the coefficient variation as it varies. So I will not go into details of this formula, but it was shown that uh, at first the coefficient variation uh, decreases, which will be true of ductile failure, uh, Gaussian distribution, but then it stabilizes as constant, which is a characteristic of, uh, uh, of viral distribution. Now, another aspect. So I mentioned there existed until 1987 only two models. Weakest link, chain, if one element change, the whole thing fails. It must be finite, as shown here, in most cases, and fiber bundle. This result of Daniel, which is, gives exactly the distribution. We found out that another system, which is actually uh, modeling nature behavior, uh, also can be solved analytically, exactly under certain assumptions, and then extrapolated. Uh, in nature, you have on the micrometer scale system of platelets connected by biopolymer in shear, there is almost no resistance in tension between one plate, plate and the next, and everything depends on sheet transmission of these layers. So, uh, in a way simplified for probabilistic handling, you have basically a set of links between material uh, points, and the links have certain probability of failure, and that gives the whole probability of failure. This can be solved analytically, uh, which I've shown that several years ago. Uh, the result is this. So if we plot probability Weibull scale, Weibull distribution of weakest link model is straight line. This is Weibull modulus. If we do exactly in fishnet, I call it fishnet statistics, uh, failure with up to two links. This is failure of one link decides. If you need two links to cause failure, you get this curve. If you need three links to cause failure, you get this curve. These are analytical curves, exactly agree. Now, this last one will be hard, but it's simulated. When Luo here simulated one million Monte Carlo runs for each case. So each point is an aggregate of about 5,000 points. That's how this is so smooth. And here, one million is not enough to, de to, enough to determine 10 minus 5. You would need 10 million for 10 minus 6. So that's a scatter here. You see, this difference is enormous. This is 75% uh, of strengths, mean strengths. This is 75, so that's more than 2 to 1. And you see that if you have this parallel coupling, in addition to weakest link, you enormously increase the strength of the material where it matters for probability of 1 minus uh, 10 power minus 6. You see this change. It's enormous change. And that's what we should be looking for in design. Now, we are now trying to extend this. These calculations were for fishnets of several hundred links. Now, what happens if uh, you have not 1,000 links, but you have 1 million of them, or 100,000? Then, obviously, it must go to a continuum. And you have a certain number of links, failure not with two links, but maybe with 20 links. They would form a crack in this continuum. 
What is interesting probabilistically is continuum with a Laplace equation. And crack, you can show it's a Laplace equation, but crack can be solved. It's a positive geometry. Uh, so one crack would cause uh, failure. So that must go to Weibo distribution. And so that we did not simulate. That's too much. But it must eventually go through the straight line. But what is interesting, the straight line is uh, has a slope 3 times Weibo modulus. It is much less scattered than here. Weibo modulus is here, M. This goes to, actually can be seen as an envelope of several straight lines, uh, transition, uh, mathematically. And this is 2M and the 3M. The 3M appears here. So I tried to match it. And we found a beautiful relationship, actually, uh, two months ago. Namely, that derivative of y with respect to x, x is logarithm strength, this is a slope, is a linear function of y. The simple differential equation can be solved. It matches analytically all these cases and can be extended also to this. So this has not been published yet. We are about to write it up. Uh, oh my god, I don't know. Anyway, so. Uh, the exact solution of Laplace equation is very simple. It was done in complex variables. Displacement is shown, doesn't show here. Stress vectors in infinite fish net gives, again, complex variable solution. Simplified version of Westergaard solution. This is a complex variable. Uh, sigma y, sigma x. It gives separated stress of the field. Self factor disappeared. I don't know what happened with this uh, mathematics here. But anyway, it was proven here that geometry is positive, a rectangular fishnet. We didn't look at other shape. So crack becomes dynamic as soon as it forms, and it would probably require about 20 links to represent the crack. We extended this analysis recently, two years ago, to octet architectures, which are of great interest because it provides uh, printed which provides the lightest material for a given strength, uh, also given stiffness, lightest possible. Actually, this system, this is octet, based on tetrahedrals, can be composed of four fishnets in three different directions. That's the way to calculate it. Uh, this is weakest link model. This is two-turn fishnet, three-turn fishnet, which is on acre, for example. But for octet, it goes farther. So octet is safer. You gain even more, you gain, of course, in, in the mean, which is calibrated to the same mean or median, same mean or median. But uh, if you extend it to n power minus 6, octet gives additional advantage for safety uh, at the range where you want. And fiber bundle is actually here, so getting very close to that optimum behavior. Now, I see bigger implications which have not analyzed yet. But if you look at transmission of force chain in small samples, they are at lowland parallel, they are increasing transverse connections. Obviously, this is not just weak link model, uh, but there's some perturbation of weak link model, but it's not like fishnet. There are equal number of parallel series connections. There are still many more series connections than parallel connections, so it's a candidate for perturbation analysis. And perturbation analysis uh, can probably capture it, but this has not been done yet. Now, I would like to emphasize this picture from those of you who are testing materials, optimizing them. Uh, we have examples now that uh, of these two curves. This is a Fischner distribution. This is Weibull uh, distribution, uh, weakest link. And obviously, this one is stronger. It is stronger by uh, oh, this one is weaker than the other, 8% weaker. But if you go to the tail, it's the opposite, 35% higher. So by optimizing the mean, we are not sure that uh, we are getting what we want, because we want safety. We cannot care just about the mean. Material scientists, uh, civil engineering testers, uh, I think, don't realize this problem, but it is essential. So finally, I would like to make a pitch on a problem which everybody speaks about, CO2 emissions from cement production, we know are equal to those of all the cars and trucks in the world worldwide now. Trajectory straight up for fuel, uh, fossil fuels is decreasing. And this 
uh, good to look at it from the viewpoint of safety factors. So safety factors in diagram shear before the side effect was introduced range from about 1.3 to 8. We, we could document, uh, computationally of course. Enormous range. Now if you introduce uh, side effect, another side effect is diminished. But anyway, I put here failure probability of various structures assumed they are organized by, by the value of failure probability. This is the number of structures, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and so forth. So this is a decreasing curve. If you have more structures, you can find failure probability. Optimally, you have 10 power minus 6. Some structures are over-designed. These are these. They are too safe, wasteful, which leads to excessive cement use, and that significantly increases CO2 emissions. So good safety factors means lower CO2 emissions. We are wasting concrete, which has terrible effects on, on the climate. But on the other side, too, if the probability of failure is too high, that not necessarily means a failure. It would be one in a thousand, one in a hundred, but in all structures it would mean uh, that cracks form. If cracks in concrete are wider than 0.2 millimeter, you get ingress of water and corrosive agents. Everybody thinks ferrous occur due to corrosion, but no, it always starts with this prediction of creep, shrinkage, and cracking caused by it. So we cause failures prematurely. That means not lower CO2 emissions now, but after 10 or 20 years, it's with a delay. So both are bad for climate. For climate, we need uniform safety factors. So as a final thought, in solid and structural mechanics, the problems of scaling and asymptotic matching have long been ignored. This ought to change. They are essential for safety, durability, and sustainability. And because of the huge CO2 imprint, dwarfing all other materials, uh, Concrete ought to emerge as a major topic in material science departments and in TMA programs. So with this, I would like to acknowledge my main collaborators on Guyen, most of the work in aluminum and some of the testing in Hermes. All these contributed at least a little bit uh, to, to this talk. So thanks for listening, and I would like to put an ad here on my book, which appeared two months ago, a course of quasi fracture mechanics and side effect. Thank you. The um, question time. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Okay, in the meanwhile, we get someone not to be shy to ask. I would like you to say a little bit more about, you know, size effect, and you are very much linked. You, you give huge contribution to this field. Uh, for the younger ones that are not so familiar, maybe you can say a few words about the physics. What's the, really the reasons? why, you know, a structure which is tiny behave differently to fracture with respect to the huge one. Now, all this is informed by some physics. Uh, mechanics is part of physics, right? Yes. So, for example, vibro distribution, in my opinion, it has, is, the, is a consequence of frequency of intermotoric bone failures, which is a well-known fact. And how to deduce from it is physics again. It's, uh, it's mechanics. Yeah, you ask, the, you raise a point which I think is essential. We need to, we need in all engineering teach physics and introduce it into scaling considerations because just by mathematics, by computations, you cannot reach it. In computation mechanics, they will not solve this problem. But without doing, in, in as civil engineers, for example, mechanical engineers, we will not either. It needs combination. Yes, I agree. Thank you. We have a question there. Hi, Jan, a great talk as usual. Uh, there's a lot to learn here. It will probably take a month to digest everything you presented. 
Um, I have one comment and a question. So one comment is that uh, even in the composite community, this is a side effect that you showed is pervasive, and uh, most of the standards, the STM standard, the CMH17 that are used to characterize the material, completely neglect size effect. So I think what you showed today is very important. So we need as a community, we need to implement these size effect loads uh, in our computational models and standards. Um, one question regarding the uh, GET test. So typically when you have a stress-free crack, uh, the size effect is mostly energetic because uh, it is governed by the fractal process zone in front of the crack tip. Um, do you think that in the case of a larger crack parallel stress, let's say close to 80% of the average strength, there might also be a statistical component of size effect? Because in that case, the volume that is subjected to very large stress, stress is pretty high. Exactly, you hit just the right point. As a very high compression, uh, you don't decrease the width of the process zone, of course, because it's damaged, but you weaken it and effectively acts as if it was narrower, but it is not narrower. So it needs to be described by some formula. Uh, it's a poorly damaged. Uh, it, okay, so why, if I should expand this, why you get the widening of the process zone? Because in process zone there are inclined cracks. At first you include compression, you have static, static friction on the inclined cracks. They don't slip. So that actually leads to increase uh, able to transmit crack parallel stress. Eventually they slip. With the slip you have a drop from static friction to sliding or dynamic friction and that causes the expansion but when they go to very high load we know we get opposite effect and this is due to the fact that the metal is weakened into basically set of, crack parallel, of parallel splitting cracks in the process zone. So that we haven't modeled yet. We sort of into the season. We need a model like that. Maybe you can work it out. <laughs> you can do that. Please. Uh, Luca. Yes, Luca. Can you comment in? Um, on if there is some relation between the parallel tracks, and parallel stress, and the sides of the fracture that is uh, propagated on the after the, 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 the initiation. And then I have another question on slide numbers here. I guess when you 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 are show something on the diffusion and on the characteristic. Uh, value um, of time over size square. Is this related to the structure of the diffusion equation that has... A well, that time over size square is for creep. And this creep analysis we did not extend to failure. Or actually it goes in uh, fatigue, it goes to failure in, in time eventually. But it has to do with simply diffusion theory. It's not, uh, there's a different, different physics. That's, uh, this physics of diffusion, right? Uh, all diffusion theory, whether it's... Uh, right, that's a very big property of diffusion. Whether it is uh, uh, driven by gradient of stress or whether it's driven uh, by statistics, e either diffusion uh, has this kind of behavior. And the first question on the possibility to have uh, uh, a relation between parallel stress and the Sides of the uh, that's an interesting point. It might be, we have not studied that. But we are not speaking of failure and creep, uh, unless we look at long times. Uh, in the, uh, usually, structures for a long time in creep are loaded uh, less than half the strength limit. They may go to fail eventually, as this bridge in Palau, but there was some different reason. You know that in uh, strain gradient uh, uh, modeling, you can have uh, um, the connection between uh, the size effect with the characteristic length and also with the... Oh, yeah. the That's right, uh, gradient, uh, gradient theory. That's kind of non-local, weak non-local theory, yes. That's true. That's, uh, although 
I don't favor local theories because they don't have a correct boundary conditions. But you are right that with green effect you get side effects too uh, of different kind.